thanks for coming along. Thanks for doing this interview with me, Andrew. So when I met you before, we found out we both work in fraud detection. So I think this will be a great time for people who are interested in the field to learn more about fraud detection and be able to hear the experiences of two people who actually work in that field, because even though it's very common in machine learning, it's something that if you're not in the field, you probably don't know that much about. So we could probably start off by just saying, giving like a little intro, and then we can get into like what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Absolutely. So, so um, yeah. Well, first thing, thank you for having me. Uh, data Life, uh, make sure to subscribe to this channel right now. Uh, hit that like button. Uh, he is making really good content. And I should know, because I was in his exact shoes a couple months ago, uh, because of the kind of passion that you have to put into a YouTube channel, it, uh, it ends up being important that, uh, we see through some of these commitments to the end. And I'm hoping that you uh, continue to upload consistently, man, because it's good stuff. Thanks. Uh, about me, I work for a, uh, I don't keep my company a secret, but I don't talk about it on YouTube. So let's say I work for a cryptocurrency FinTech company. Uh, I, before that I worked for probably the FinTech company. Um, and before that I had a mishmash of different uh, positions in a hedge fund and then as a natural language company. Uh, and, uh, and since then I've had the opportunity to pick up a couple of data science specializations, mainly like you mentioned, fraud detection, having to be able to turn in, uh, several different, uh, unsupervised algorithms. And we'll talk about the difference between supervised and unsupervised soon, but then also a lot of pre-trained models that exist, uh, as infrastructure for our company to, to draw upon open source, uh, models and other kinds of models that. Uh, the Facebooks and Googles have already trained in the world. Uh, drawing upon the, uh, those models and leveraging that kind of machine learning technology is a fine dance of what is going to be best for the company and what is going to be the most 80-20 approach for a data scientist. So the, the inner workings of having to uphold, for example, a, a cryptocurrency economy ends up being, can this economy run uh, uh, successfully, fluently, or the very least, equi equitably, equi with with equity, uh, mm -hmm. can this economy run with equity without your model in place? And do bad actors get away with what they're doing to an extent that it's detrimental to the company? So those are the two questions that I'm trying to answer. Awesome. Wow. Cool. So <clears throat> I guess for me, um, I kind of stumbled into the fraud detection field. Um, I actually moved to the DC area in um, January to pursue a data science position with Hilton. It was actually a data science position on a, a revenue al analytics team. And I think what you had mentioned was um, um, I, in like one of your other videos, you were talking about how sometimes data scientists are the only data scientist person on their team. And they're pretty much explaining these techniques to people who like don't understand them as much, but are like very interested. And that was me for the, over there, which is um, something that I always like envision myself in. And then coronavirus hit, and then everybody in my team was pretty much laid off because Hilton Travel Industry coronavirus, you know, didn't doesn't mesh. Everybody got laid off. So then I found a job, bringing me to my current job, um, doing actually fraud detection for the U.S. government. So um, it wasn't something that um, I like necessarily had a passion for at the time, but working there has been very interesting. And honestly, like it's, um, it's very captivating. It's actually kind of very interesting with just the, like you said, learn, working with unsupervised models and um, other parts of um, machine learning that you've never even heard of. Like um, something that I learned about is an isolation forest, which is a type of random forest specifically for like, um, fraud detection for anomaly detection, which is probably something that most people haven't heard of. It's just a whole field that um, you can get to learn out, learn about that, you know, nobody really looks at um, courses for isolation for us. But um, it's just something I guess you know that other people might not look into. My favorite, but, well, that's um, probably my favorite algorithm. I love random forest, but uh, oh, really? random yeah. forest, uh, an isolation forest. I've actually made a video about this. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. You uh, uh, and I called it socially distanced AI, uh, which, yeah. <laughs> which is fun, topical, and uh, and honestly, one of the most like one of the best performing and fastest algorithms out there for fraud detection. Yeah, 
I definitely like any <laughs> any type of decision tree model because it's the only one, especially when you're in the practical field, like it's the only one you can really explain to people <laughs> right. like how it's working. And also you don't really need to clean the data that much, which is honestly that saves you a lot of time. Right. <laughs> cool. Um awesome. So what do you do um day to day for um where you work? Well, what do you what would you say the diff, the day to day is for somebody in fraud detection? So let me let me uh because I have the the blessing of being able to have a completely different experience maybe a couple years ago. So I'll talk mm -hmm. about how my day to day has changed now that I work uh, one fully remote, two for a much smaller company, probably ten uh, x if not a fifty x smaller, uh, and then three uh, how I balance that with uh, getting the the most important OKRs done as well as the research element because i think what well, what was the company you came from again i came the from i came from like the fintech company uh, okay uh silicon valley one of the founding fathers of silicon valley okay okay uh so that company was specifically working on uh if the, if at all any fraud detection it was mainly looking at like legacy infrastructure of like historically fraudulent actors right and taking those historically fraudulent actors and then like settling debts, going to them and being like, hey, your, your balance and XYZ uh, amount uh, was fraudulent back in like January of whatever year. Uh, whereas like real time fraud detection was handled by a different team. So that's something that like ends up being, uh, ends up being a question of like when your day to day is mostly historical analyses and not really setting up uh, like active barriers like with a machine learning model uh, that ends up being a data science position that can be emulated by more uh, more people in the analytical spectrum for example an analyst could do a historical analysis as well uh, but they probably won't stop somewhere near forecasting and a b testing right experimentation is going to be somewhere on the data scientist spectrum the differences in the tools is that main most of the time you could do historical analyses with excel right it would just take a lot more time and it wouldn't be scalable It'd be on an ad hoc basis. But uh, I was one of the, the data scientists on the team that was taking the, the data that a, a, an analyst might have uh, procured or the very least cleaned up a tiny bit. And then I would plug that into SQL or SQL Alchemy uh, and, and manipulate it with Python. So that was my day-to-day, -day, taking old data, making some sense of it, uh, finding out which bad actors had, had debts to settle and then uh, trying to track them down. Um, I did a lot other stuff that's like maybe 20% of my of my work day, but in terms of fraud detection, that was what I was doing. Now here uh, at my current company, I would be working on like most exclusively on the hyperparameter tuning and just making sure the model uh, that we put in place is actually working. The way the model works uh, uh, without going to a humongous amount of detail is an ensemble base. So mm -hmm. we have a couple of models that specifically uh, try and have the best recall so that we can catch uh, bad actors, even if we have to catch some good apples as well. And then a couple of other models that uh, try to try to perfect the precision and other uh, and another like generally good accepted uh, metrics, F1 score, area under the curve, uh, making sure that the model generally performs okay. Because if we capture too many uh, good apples along with uh, the batch of bad apples, then we're ultimately going to uh, maybe have if we automatically try and retrain the model with the new bad apples, we will have we will capture some sort of weird data drift that will be self uh, like a, a self fulfilling prophecy of like uh, we think that people from Seattle are bad actors and then slowly it would drift towards that becoming true, uh, even if the the actual data doesn't represent that. Um, awesome, but that's way different than like collecting data, ingesting it. EDA and then running like visualizations and reports on it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up how you uh, measure how you measure the models actually with using recall because that's something that I've been kind of stressing that we need to use at my uh, at what we're doing right now for fraud detection because right now um, a lot of people are looking at our model and saying like oh like their their accuracy is 99 point something percent and I'm like oh, okay that's because most of the people aren't committing fraud so it's pretty easy. To <laughs> able yeah, to label that but um yeah I, it's a lot uh, of course with fraud detection it's a lot more important to 
not miss somebody that's committing fraud as opposed to maybe marking somebody's committing fraud who's who's not commit, committing fraud so i think it's cool that you touched upon that um yeah for me we have um my entire team does fraud detection so there's a lot of moving parts so i can give you um an overview of there's actually what i call like two main models which I actually don't work on um, that much, but I have other models that go into the main models and I'll get into the, the details. So when I say the main models, um, the first main model we have is a giant autoencoder, which takes transactional data and it looks at all the, um, the people who, and it looks at all their access records. So let me go back and say, I do internal fraud detection. So I look at people, employees, accessing people's um, like financial records. So we're monitoring the employees, not the general public. Oh. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I do internal fraud detection. So the first model pretty much takes all transactional data and it looks at the employees and it looks at all the records they were, ac they were accessing and it looks like what system they were accessing at what time, things like that. And it outputs a risk likelihood score, which is like the likelihood score that the behavior is risky, which is something that our client really wants. They always want these likelihood scores. We had other models that pretty much just flagged like yes, fraud, no, not fraud, and they didn't want that. They said, no, every behavior needs a probability, which is kind of makes sense if you think about it. So the first auto encoder, it pretty much takes all the transactional data just as an input straight from the database, and then it gives a risk likelihood score just on what the auto encoder was um, trained on. And then there is a, um, a second model called the random forest model. And this one is, uh, more of a flagging model. It does uh, um, output like another, like um, they call it like an anomaly score and a risk score, but they're they're literally both the same. Um, but this one is um, trained to flag specific um, behaviors. So this one is more um, based on specific flagging criteria. So if a person accesses somebody's records outside of work hours, that's automatically flagged. If a person accesses their own records, that's automatically flagged. If they access their how their spouse's record, that's automatically flagged. So the random forest motor looks like things like that that are more strict and flags things that we call um, use cases or like um, indicators of fraud. And some things are um, some things are automatically flagged as fraud. Like I said, accessing your own records, automatically fraud. Other things where it's like you access somebody's record repeatedly in the same time frame it's not flagged as fraud but it's flagged as being like suspicious so the random forest will do that and then what i do is i create a lot of the inputs for um actually both of the models too um so what i'm working on right now is i'm working on an lstme and um the other person I work with, he has a PhD in mathematics, actually. So we're, we're on this uh, project right now where it's actually very innovative because not many people have done this before. We've only found one white paper online about it, but we're using an LSTM for fraud detection where pretty much we make a synthetic data set of transactions and we label um, certain transactions in the data set as um, fraudulent. Um, specifically fraudulent and being like a sequential pattern where of accessing um, people's data. So um, whenever you access somebody's data, they have um, like an identifier number. And sometimes people, you'll see their accesses, they're accessing identifier numbers that are just like increasing by one, which is um, very suspicious. Obviously, if you're accessing people's records, all the number, all the people's identifier should be completely random. But if there's some sort of pattern, then that's suspicious behavior. So we're training the LSTM on a um, bunch of sequential patterns in the data set and then actually running that model on actual real transactional data. And I'm glad you brought up unsupervised and supervised because from my experience, the only time you use an unsupervised model is when you don't have <laughs> labels to make it a supervised model. So we're pretty much imposing labels on an unsupervised data to make it a supervised model. 
and it's still in the testing set. Um, I'm, yeah, it's still in the testing phase. Phage, but um, did I say phage? It's still in the testing stage, but it's getting a lot of um, great results. And honestly, it's very exciting because it's a very innovative way to use um, recurrent neural networks. They actually aren't really used for sequential pattern detection or fraud detection that much. I think that the, the, you're working on like cutting edge technology for the US government, which is surprising one, because uh, yeah. apparently the James Bond uh, Casino Royale scenes are, are real. Uh, <laughs> uh, when they like, he's trying to hack and then they're like, oh, we caught him in like two seconds. Uh, and two, that the US government's actually onto some, uh, some, some good stuff, some like pretty advanced yeah. technology. You wouldn't expect to say cutting edge technology and U.S. government in the same sentence, but that's why they're they're um, they're they're that's why we're contracted out to them. Yes, and then we get little updates of oh, the Pentagon is spending this much money on artificial intelligence, or GSA now wants to innovate this. So they're coming around. <laughs> they really are. So yeah, it's um uh, it's great. It's very um innovative. I work with a lot of people who are smarter than me, which is awesome. Um, like I said, um. The other guy that I'm working with, he has a PhD from George Mason, great dude. Um, he's handling, at first it was me on my, by myself doing this project. And then um, I started making some good projects and then my boss realized it was like, clearly this is not a one person project. So um, this other guy hopped on the team and he's um, he's been taking it the lead now mostly and we'll, we'll really work on it, but it, it's, it's great. Yeah, I like it a lot. I like, I like having his expertise a lot. Yeah, I like yeah. I like how you have mentors in the field. I also uh, condolences for the fact that COVID laid you off, but you bounced back faster, so fast actually that it's basically like a, a hero's journey. Uh, so I think that's inspirational for a lot of the different mentees that I've worked with, uh, people who have also been laid off in the pandemic. Uh, if you can have the right skills, if you have the right mindset, the market's still very mismatched for the amount of data scientists in supply and the amount of data scientists in demand. Very few people yeah. have that mathematical, computational, and like uh, uh, like statistical understanding and putting all three yeah, together. We're, we're definitely in a great field. And to be honest, when I was applying for jobs in the pandemic, I also was being pretty picky and it took me about two months to get a job. So <laughs> we were definitely in a very, uh, we're definitely in a very secure um, field. Yeah, I got, actually got a job, got a paycheck for that job before I got any unemployment payment. Um, that's incredible. Not that I didn't apply in time, it took that long to come. But anyway, that's a different topic. <laughs> that's a different topic. But, that's <laughs> yeah. uh, Greg, yeah. this was really great. I do have to jump off. Uh, thank yeah. you for having me on. Um, I'm excited to do something else in the future. Uh, and make sure to smash that like button for Greg. Uh, one, more, one more call, subscribe, smash that like button, head over to my channel if you want to see uh, very similar content. Uh, and once again, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. Remember to like and subscribe to Andrew Mo too. And thank you guys for watching.